the Israelites um, stayed where they were because they'd established themselves in those cities, um, in, in Babylon, in, in the northern part of um, Assyria. So, but some of these faithful Jews are raised up to places of prominence. So we hear about some of these Jews. We mentioned, uh, Nathan mentioned uh, Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, Azariah. Um, they became leaders in Babylon. Um, we also hear the account of Esther and Mordecai, so some of those great people. Um, so this is around that time. Okay, so... Now we get the number of 50,000, it's in chapter 7. Um, it's also recorded in um, Ezra, um, when it goes through the genealogy of the remnant that went returned to Jerusalem. It's, it's my calculation, it, it's, it's strange in... I will not say strange... Um, it's just about identical, the account of the, the remnant that went back. I think the difference there being the singers um, and those that, that sang unto the Lord. I think um, Ezra says there was 200, uh, but in Nehemiah it says 245. So the actual number was just, just shy of 50,000 that did return. Um, and when you consider the 50,000 uh, and, and how many Jews were actually in exile, it's, it was a very, very small percentage. Um, on some accounts, it's less than 2% that returned. But they did return. Okay, so the book of Nehemiah begins 15 years after the book of Ezra ends. Okay, almost 100 years after the first captives came back to the promised land. Okay, and we find that the wars of Jerusalem were in rubble. So who was Nehemiah? So let's quickly go to um, Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 11 and we'll see who Nehemiah was. And in the last part there, it says he was the king's cupbearer. Okay, so a cupbearer was historically an officer of high rank in royal courts whose duty was to pour and serve drinks. Cupbearer at the royal table. So this was on the, on the account of constant fear and plots to poison the, the king. So a cupbearer would have, have been regarded as someone who was thoroughly trustworthy, um, someone um, who was required to be a man of irreproachable loyalty, capable of winning the king's complete confidence. So this is Nehemiah. He had the office of the cupbearer, and being the cupbearer, I mean, you drink regularly, so he would have been in the king's presence um, quite a lot, and probably a potentially a man of influence, or a trusted, obviously a trusted advisor. So who wrote the book of Nehemiah? So when we read the, um, the first chapter 1, verse 1 there, it says the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass, and so the words of Nehemiah. So it has been said there that um, Nehemiah wrote the book, but there has been some conjecture around whether Ezra may have penned some of the words as well, um, because he's described as being a skilled scribe. So when and where was it written? So it is said to be around 444 BC. Okay, and in verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, and it, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace. And also there in chapter 2, verse 1, and it came to pass in the, in the month Nisan in the 20th year of, I know, I listened to Nathan's lesson last week, he pronounced that art of, Artaxerxes, um, but I have heard it pronounced Artaxerxes. Either way, that was the king at the time. So it was in the twentieth year of his reign, which re which refers to the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, and he ruled from a period of four sixty four to four twenty four BC. So, what are some of the distinctive features of this book? So it is a continuation of the account that begins in the book of Ezra. I just really mentioned that. Um, the books of Ezra, interesting, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah originally made up one book in the original Hebrew scriptures. Um, for example, we can see the genealogy there in Ezra, I think it's chapter 2, and also in Nehemiah chapter 7. Um, and a lot of the accounts are, are very similar, with Ezra going back to build the, the temple, um, and we, Ezra is mentioned in Nehemiah um, in chapter 8. Uh, so 
It has been said that around the third century it was separated into two books. So that we get Ezra and Nehemiah. And it is, like I said, it is an important time period in the Jewish history. It included the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem as well, in, as, well as rebuilding the spiritual lives of the Jews who had returned from captivity. Okay, so when they returned, they found that their city was in ruins. The wall about the city of Jerusalem had been reduced to rubble, um, which left them vulnerable to attacks by their enemies. So under the direction of Nehemiah, the Israelites began to rebuild the wall. Okay, so Nehemiah can be broken up into, I guess, two main parts. So the rebuilding of the walls, chapter 1 to chapter 7. Then the second part is around the revival and reform of the Jewish nation from chapter 8 through to chapter 13. So within chapter 1 to 7, there are, there are eight different points I want to bring out. And in chapter 8 to verse, uh, chapter 13, there's three points there I want to bring out. So the rebuilding of the walls. Okay, so Nehemiah hears of the distress and remnant at Jerusalem. So that's from chapter 1, 1 to 4. Let's just read that. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th years I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, me, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So this is the city walls we're talking about. We've learnt that in, in Ezra. Um, the temple had been rebuilt. Um, so they were back in the practice of worshipping um, and carrying on those ordinances. Um, so this is an account of the walls still being in rubble. So it says, actually, what's interesting there in, in verse 4, it says that when he heard these words, that he sat down and wept and fasted certain and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Isn't that interesting? Um, you know, I, I thought about that. You know, when we hear, you know, Nehemiah heard of the distress of and the, um, the state of, of the city of Jerusalem and it grieved him that much that um, it, he had to sit down, had a bit of a cry. Um, and then he fasted and prayed because of that situation. Um, I'm probably guilty of this. You hear someone in the church saying, you know, we've got a prayer request. You know, someone's having a bit of difficulty in one area. Yes, we'll pray for you. We pray for them for a day, maybe a week. And then it seems to be forgotten. Um, we should probably obviously have more of a heart like Nehemiah. <laughs> So from chapter 1, verse 5 to 11, that we hear Nehemiah's prayer. Okay? And what's interesting about that is when he prays to God, in verse 8 he says, Remember, so he's asking the Lord, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and I will bring them unto the place that I've chosen to set my name there. He's actually quoting two passages of scripture out of the, um, the, the Pentateuch. So he's actually referring to Leviticus 26, where he talks about when you transgress. So he's saying, Lord, remember when you said this back in Leviticus? Um, chapter 26, verse 30, 33, it says, And I will scatter you among the heathen. Um, and there in verse 9, where he says, and he's reminding the Lord of what he promised the children of Israel, and he refers to Deuteronomy, chapter 30. Um, I won't read all of it, but he's saying there, but if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were, were of you cast out under the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and I will bring them unto the place that I've chosen to set my name there. And Deuteronomy 30, chapter... Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 to 5. There's a, I'm not going to read all of it. But it does say there in verse 2, And if thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God and obey his voice, um, then I will then, that then the Lord thy God will, ret will turn thy captivity, captivity and have compassion upon thee. 
and return and gather thee from all nations. So that's what Nehemiah is asking the Lord. And it's interesting, Luke mentioned a few weeks ago, I'm not sure if you remember in, this, in a message, he goes, you know, sometimes we find it, find it difficult to pray. You know, Lord, what do we pray about? Um, you know, sometimes we have a bit of a blank. But there are so many examples in the Bible. We can re- refer to his word. You know, in the book of Psalms, there's a lot, lots of prayer in there. We can refer there. And we can pray um, according to his word to help us in our lives. Um, and I do encourage you, if you've ever, when I've been going through the Gospels in my daily devotions, have a look at the, um, the prayer of Mary. It's actually a really, well, I found it. To me, it was just a, a powerful prayer. Um, have a look through that. Great example of prayer. Um, if you ever have trouble with that. Uh, just as Nehemiah here prayed to the Lord, he just reminded God of some of the promises that he had for his people. And there in chapter 2, verse 1, it says that, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been aforetime sad in his presence. Okay. Now this is interesting here. So we've got here, in, if you look at the, the time period in chapter 1, verse 1, it talks about the month of Chislu in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign. And he hears the news. He's distressed. He, he prays and fasts over a period of time. Then we come to chapter 2, verse 1, where he's before the presence of the king. And it tells you the month there. It's Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. Now, I had a quick look at that, what those, um, I guess, those Hebrew months were. And it's actually from December through to around March or April. So it's about a four or five month period he'd been praying before, he, you know, before the king noticed his, his countenance. That's a lot of prayer. And when you consider that, it took him four months of prayer for a 52 day build. Um, yeah, I found that um, quite interesting. So, Nehemiah, the, the king notices his countenance and Nehemiah had prayed, you know, because he wanted to, you know, he had a heart to do something. Um, and he asked that the Lord would, um, that the Lord would hear his prayer in chapter 1, verse 11, um, and that the children of Israel would prosper and that he'd prosper before the king. And in verse, chapter 2, verse 1 there, we see that this is starting to unfold now. When the king asked him, why are you sad? And in chapter 2, verse 3, Nehemiah says, let the king live forever. Why would, why would not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Okay, and then he makes request to the king to go back. So he requested mercy and that God would bless him before the king of Persia. And we see that the king notices his sad countenance and asks him what is troubling him and grants his request to send him to Judah to begin the work of rebuilding the city walls. Okay. And he also requests some letters so that he, to the governors of the land as he passes through the land that um, they'd give him free passage and also for, uh, through a letter unto Asaph for the materials to rebuild the gates of the city. So when he gets to, Jew, uh, gets to Jerusalem, it's in chapter, uh, verse 11 there, chapter 2, he, he spends three days surveying the ruin, and he does that at night time. He doesn't let anyone know what's going on. He goes out. He doesn't know that he, he hasn't told anyone that he's back there to rebuild the walls. He goes and does an assessment first of what the city walls are like. Then we go to the next part of this rebuilding the walls in chapter 2, verse 17 to 20. He meets with the Jewish rulers and nobles and encourages the people to build the wall. And in verse 18 it says, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good unto me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Then in chapter 3, we go through all those that are building to the work, uh, are building the, um, the gates and start the beginning of the work of the wall. Okay, so Nehemiah 3 is all about work, how individuals pitched in and did the work together, coordinated and led by Nehemiah. The gates were obviously the entry points into the cities and these were what you would say the pillars or reference points onto which the walls were built. 
When you read through chapter 3, it names all the individuals involved in this great work. So there's a lot of people named through there. Chapter 3. Then in chapter 4, he started a work and he gets um, some opposition. Who can remember the names of the, um, the governors that opposed the work that, without reading it? Who can remember the names of the... Th- there was actually three. Two of them were quite often named, but there's, there's actually a third one as well. It was Sanballat and Tobiah. Does that ring a tune? Sanballat and Tobiah. Um, and there was another gentleman. I can't... Where is he? Um, he was from Gishan. I can't... I'll, I'll come across it soon. Uh... So they were governors in the land and they saw the work that was happening and they took great indignation and mocked the Jews. They were attacks of discouragement. However, because Nehemiah and the workers did in fact have legal protection from king because they had those letters from King Artaxerxes, um, Sanballat and Tobiah had no authority to actually stop the work. So all they could do was discourage, try and discourage him from stopping. You know, isn't this very similar to the Christian walk? When you are determined to do a work for the Lord and his people, there are those that come along to discourage, discourage and mock us. And we, we see in this chapter how Nehemiah responded to these attacks. Again, in verse 4, you'll see that it was in prayer. So in chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, um, Tobiah the Ammonite even says, um, said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Nehemiah responds by prayer in verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them a, for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity and let it, not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. There we go, they had a mind to work. Right. Um, when when Samballat and Tobiah realised they were that their mocking and verbal threats did not stop the work, they actually conspired to unite and attack with violence. In verse eight, it says there, we've tried to start at verse seven, but it came to pass that when Samballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and go fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Okay. Not only... So that was the opposition from outside, but there, actually there's some opposition then starts coming from the insides, from amongst the workers, and that's in, from verse 10. We can read that. I'm not going to go through all of it because this is just an overview and we'll run out of time. I'm running out of time already. Um, The workers were discouraged by the news of Sambalad and Tobiah and started to waver and murmur. The work also seemed too big and too great. Um, It is also in this chapter we see that everyone that wrought a work on the wall carried a sword on their side at all times. So they were ready to fight. So they were prepared and they were building, well, they, while I had the sword on the side, they are still building the wall. And it says that Nehemiah also set watches in place morning and evening so the work could continue. So then we get to chapter 6. We see that Sembalat and Geshem, that's the other bloke, try to lure Nehemiah out of Jerusalem in the guise of meetings to do him mischief. So they're still trying to stop the work. And it says that he sent the invitation five times, but Nehemiah refused to go because he knew that um, they, were to, they were going to do him harm. And when that didn't work, um, it's interesting, they actually had, they, they paid someone on the inside to have him killed. And it's in, uh, where is that? Uh, I did have that written down, I've got to find it. There, it's Shemaiah, chapter 6, verse 10. It says there, Afterwards I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabil, who was shut up. 
And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. So he said, let's you two, just you and I, let's just go into the temple and shut the gate, shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. So he's talking about Sembala and Tobiah, um, because he says they're going to come and slay thee. And, you know, it's safe in there. And Nehemiah responds, he knows he's not, he's actually, he's not a Levite to start with, so he has no place to be in the temple. Um, but he knew that in verse 12 it says there, I lower perceived that God had not sent him, but he, that he pronounced this prophecy against me for Tobiah and Sembalat had hired him. So there was uh, someone on the inside that wanted to do him mischief as well. So against all this opposition, the, the, war, the um, building of the wall still continues. So in Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 15, we read there that the war was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Edel, in 50 and 2 days. So there we find that it was built in 52 days. That's amazing. To build a wall that was in literal ruin um, in 52 days. So this wall, wall could, that was completed in 52 days, it says that the enemies could see that the work, work was wrought of their God to be done so quickly. In verse 16 it says, And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, you know, that the wall had been completed in such a short time, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in fear, cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. So they could see God's hand in it. Then we go to chapter 7. Again, this is the register of the remnant um, of the people. And it goes through the genealogy. And that genealogy is exactly the same as what we find in Ezra chapter 2. I think it was Ezra chapter 2 of the remnant that return. And that concludes the first half of Nehemiah. Now the second part we talked about. So the first part was around rebuilding the wall. And the second part is around the revival and reform of the, of the nation of Israel. Or those dwelling there. Okay. So, chapter 8. Everyone should be familiar with this one. Okay, so this is the Bible reading by Ezra. So the law is read and explained. Okay, I'll just read a couple of verses here in chapter 8. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street. So this is after the war was completed. They've all gathered together. That was before the water gate. And they spoke, spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until the midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra, the scribe, stood upon a pulpit of wood which they made for that purpose. And beside him stood, I'm not going to read all the names, but there's 13 other men. It was, um, I think it was six on the right-hand side and seven on the left-hand side. And those men were there to help interpret and explain the reading to the people as, as Ezra read it. And as Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, verse 5, for he was above all the people, um, so everyone could see him because he was on that pulpit, and when he opened, opened it, all the people stood up. So that's essentially where we get um, that practice we have in our church, that when we read from God's word, we all stand up out of reverence to it. Um, comes back to this verse here. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Then he goes through those, those 13 people there that were stood, stood by his side. They caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. And this is really interesting. And so they read in the book in the law of God distinctly. So they read the scriptures. Then they gave the sense, so they gave the meaning of it and caused them to understand the reading. I guess really that's the, um, if you read that, eight chap chapter 8, verse 8, that's how all messages should be delivered. You know, we give God's word, we explain what it means, we help you to understand what, what God has put there. 
Okay. And as a result of this reading, we go to chapter 9. Um, the people fast and they repent. So they separate themselves um, from the strangers in the land. So that was one of God's very first, um, I guess, commandments for the children of Israel, not to mix with the inhabitants of the land, um, but to separate themselves. So that had been happening during their captivity. Um, they repent of that practice and they separate themselves from the strange land. They confess their sins and worship the Lord. And in the very last verse of chapter 9, it says... That they made, and because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. So they made a sure covenant to commit their ways unto the Lord. Um, and in chapter 10 and 9 and 10, they talk about, especially chapter 10, it talks about tithing and bringing the first fruits to the house of Israel. So they start reintroducing the practices that they had forgotten for so long. Um, of giving unto the Lord. So there's, a, there's that revival in them. Then there's the reform. Um, in chapter 11, uh, they talk about, you know, there's only 40, shy of 50,000 people living in Jerusalem. Now that the war is complete, they're saying, well, we need to bring more people back um, to Jerusalem. And the decisions to made, and they, use, they actually use lots, they cast lots to bring back 10% of everyone that's out there back into the city. Um, and those that, I guess, that weren't um, part of that first lot um, still dwelled in cities around Jerusalem. So when I go back to, I guess, you know, it, it said there was about two or three million Jews that were displaced, um, that were desolate at that time during their captivity. You know, that's about an extra two, two to two, 200 to 300,000 Jews that were coming back to the city on top of the 50,000 that were already there. So that was a significant increase to the remnant that had arrived. Um, so, and the rest were to dwell in other cities round about Jerusalem. Then, actually, I finished early. It's good. So that basically concludes. We do find that Nehemiah was, I think it's chapter, I can't remember which chapter, 12, or um, I think it's chapter 12 or verse, chapter 13, where Nehemiah was actually in Jerusalem with the rebuilding of the walls and, and gathering the people and setting things in order for about... 10 or 11 years, it does say that he went back to um, King Artaxerxes because he did set a time to King Artaxerxes on how long he'd be gone for rebuilding the walls. So he did go back and then he find that at chapter 13 he comes back again and in his absence he, found, he finds that they sort of slipped back a little bit in some of their, their ways um, and so he sets that right again. Um, and that concludes Nehemiah. I, hope, I know that was a quick overview. There's so much in there. I've heard so many messages out of Nehemiah. Um, I know there's a lot of great sermons in there. And I hope you got some benefit out of it. Okay, so let's just pray and we'll just close in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this morning. We do thank you for the book of Nehemiah. We thank you for the work that was wrought there. We thank you that, Lord, you still place on the hearts of men to do a great work. Um, to be leaders, to encourage those around us. Um, and Lord, we also know that there's always opposition, but we're thankful that we can come to you in prayer, knowing that, Lord, you're a God who's in control, um, and Lord, that you want the best for us. And uh, we just ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>